Hey, how you doing? Um, today, we're going to go over the night and an interior um, project and how you'll be expected to do that. Um, so here, I have a little PowerPoint for everybody that we're gonna go through with that. So, um, what are some things that we're gonna talk about? So, we're gonna go over equipment and terms. So if you're using a DSLR um, in manual mode or any other type of um, SLR point and shoot, not your phone necessarily, um, you will need th this, these items essentially uh, in order to um, do well in doing this. So um, first you'll need a tripod, a cable release. Uh, you need to utilize <coughs> your light meter, um, bulb setting, which we'll talk about. Um, small aperture opening, meaning that uh, your um, aperture will not be large. It will be kind of close to a pinhole, so something around F8 to F16. Um, you'll be utilizing bracketing, potentially, and you'll also be learning about the concept called reciprocity failure. So what if we don't have some of these things? Um, if you don't have a tripod, you can always use something that is not going to move. So uh, a rock, a bench, um, a table, um, some, your car hood or something, you know, um, something that is still and is not going to let your camera um, tilt or any of that stuff. Um, cable release, if you don't have one of those, your, your camera might have a timer function that you can press the shutter. Um, and it, it won't jostle it that way. Um, it, you can also maybe get an app for your camera that will allow kind of a Wi-Fi uh, or Bluetooth connection between your phone and uh, your camera where you can tell it uh, to press the shutter and you can do it remotely that way. Um, so uh, yeah, that's just some, some stuff there. Um, so what does uh, bulb mean? Uh, bulb means that uh, you're gonna be photographing as long as the shutter is pressed in. So if when we went over camera mechanics and shutter speed, we know that if you are hand holding a, a camera uh, and shooting, um, at below a 60th of a second um, and you're hand holding it, then you're possibly gonna be showing motion. Um, why is this? Well, when you, you hold, so you're, you're holding your camera right, let's say, and you press it down for like a second and you're kind of wobbling, you don't know, really know it. Um, it's gonna pick up everything that the lens is seeing within that amount of time. So if it stays still though, and you press it for one second, then you'll see that everything has, unless there's something that's moving in the frame, um, everything is gonna be pretty still. So that's how we take night imagery. And that's how uh, a lot of people do um, interior imagery as well. Um, this, uh, yeah, you can also utilize a really high ISO so you can have a faster shutter speed um, in these settings or you can utilize flash. Um, but I want you to learn kind of the traditional method which is essentially letting your camera um, pick up the amount of necessary light that it needs um, on a tripod. Now, if you're using your phone or another way of um, documenting this, a um, little bit different, as in uh, 
you're not going to be experiencing what the others might be with a DSLR. So, um, but you still need to know kind of like what your camera is doing. Um, what are the fundamentals of why, why a long exposure um, basically brings out an image, et cetera. So this is the idea. Um, is that night and interior photography requires long exposures because there's limited light. Um, so there is light though, you can still see, but your camera needs a long time to kind of process that um, upwards to possibly 30 seconds. Um, I have taken <coughs> images at night um, and stacked them um, and, and post editing software and it can be upwards to probably three or four hours of exposure time um, combined. And that's when you've seen images of like star trails or like really like long moving lights, like maybe on a highway or something. That's how it's achieved is through these really long exposure times. Um, the same thing can be done in landscape photography. Um, <clears throat> if you've seen a waterfall that is, um, you know, looks like fog almost, looks like um, it's not even water anymore. It looks like it's just like a gentle mist. That's from a really long uh, shutter uh, exposure. So um, long meaning in the seconds or minutes um, or sometimes hours. Um, we don't necessarily wanna go past maybe 30 seconds um, in this case, uh, if this is your first time try trying this out. So yeah, that's what this is, is um, long exposure and limited lighting. Um, even if you feel like it's well lit, uh, you might be like in kind of more of an urban area or like downtown somewhere and there's a lot of lighting, you might be able to see it. Um, but it still might take a, a few seconds um, for your camera to respond to that. And again, thinking back on camera mechanics, it depends on what your ISO is. It depends on how much light you're letting in with both your aperture and your shutter speed in order to kind of determine <coughs> the even lighting. Um, so this is my suggestion, is to start with uh, indoor photography. Um, normally you can rely on your light meter, um, whatever it's telling you, uh, in these areas, um, use a small aperture to get that detail, um, and look for interesting light subjects. These scenes are generally kind of a still life of some sort. So, um, and this also could be like, I don't know, explore. It, it doesn't have to be in your home. Uh, normally when I do interiors, uh, I generally uh, go into a shop, maybe let's, you know, like a, a like an antique shop or something and ask the, um, uh, the, the owner if it's okay if I photograph inside. Um, and I might have just a high ISO um, where I can shoot. Um, sometimes if I, I, I know the people well, um, then I'm, I'll bring my tripod in um, and then photograph some interiors or you can go exploring. I mean, check out, you know, like just take a drive and see what you can find or think of like, uh, what, what do you have access to essentially? And what can you get access to easily in order to kind of take interesting imagery? And we can talk about subject matter. Um, uh, and when we look at the imagery um, that I've put on here in a minute. Um, so I would start with that. Um, and if you're gonna try manual settings, um, you know, I would also bracket, I would start bracketing, which means that you take an under and overexposed image and also a, um, what your light meter is saying is the right thing. So, um, that just, that, that will get you, it's, it's going to be less, uh, um, problematic with, interior lighting than it is gonna be with uh, night photography. And I'll get into why in a second. So um, yeah, um, 
that's that's uh, the first thing I would do. Um, night photography is harder. Uh, why? Because of this thing called reciprocity failure. Now, what does that mean? So this is caused by exposures usually longer than a second. Uh, it speeds below um, this, uh, your film or your digital sensor, or whatever is cap capturing the light. It uh, loses its sensitivity and how it reacts to light. It slows down and compensation needs to be given to exposure time. This also happens at very high shutter speeds. Uh, basically, you can't really trust your light meter in these situations. Uh, you have to guess. And the best way to start guessing is to bracket your imagery. Uh, so choose a scene, bracket for a second, maybe bracket for five or 10 seconds for the second image, and then maybe um, 15 to 20 or 20 to 30 for, you know, just to see what um, the image looks like. And the plus, uh, if you're using digital means, is that when you take your image, um, you can then look um, preview on your sensor and um, or uh, your LCD screen, sorry, um, and see, okay, cool. One second wasn't enough. Let's bump it up a little bit more. Or one second was too much. Maybe I need to go to like half or, um, you know, one fifteenth or something like that um, in order to get uh, the right exposure. So it's, it's a kind of a guessing game. Um, in this within this type of photography. So again, thinking about access to light um, and what a light is available to you uh, in, this, in this circumstance. Uh, so how well lit is the scene? Um, so if you're guessing, like if you're in an urban area, you're gonna be thinking about half to five seconds. If you're like in a really black, pitch black area, um, this could be, you know, 30, 30 seconds to a minute to, you know, I've said uh, previously, it could be possibly even hours if it's pitch black out. Um, and it, it also uh, is dependent on, uh, you know, how much light you're letting into the camera, not just with shutter speed, but with your ISO and your um, aperture opening. So why, why do we want a small aperture opening? I think I said this is that you want, super fine detail uh, with the, these images. Um, you don't really need a wide. You're already taking the time, literally, to uh, have a long exposure. Might as well get that really strong detail um, within the image. Um, this doesn't mean you can try larger aperture openings. It's gonna look probably a little strange if you do that, uh, but you experiment with it. You just, I think it's the best way for you to do it is just to look and to try everything. And if you need any help with any of this, please email me and please, um, you know, talk on any of the forums online. Um, I'm here to help. Um, and if it doesn't make any of this make a lick of sense, then it's okay. Um, I'm gonna be throwing up a couple other tutorial videos for you to watch in order to kind of understand what this process is all about. So yeah, uh, and if you also um, want some of these items, um, b &H video is a great uh, resource. Uh, if you're nearby, uh, hit me up and I can uh, help loan you uh, some of these materials as well. Um, yeah, we'll make it happen. And again, if you're shooting with your phone, um, this is kind of uh, not exactly moot, uh, but you need to understand um, essentially where, why your camera's able to do this to begin with. And the phone is able to do it because um, it's kind of automatically dialing in an ISO, dialing in um, kind of an aperture opening um, in order to collect the detail. And most phones uh, have limited capacity with aperture size and with uh, ISO settings. So its default is for it to go to flash photography uh, when there's not enough light available. So. 
So you light up the scene and the phone is able to receive a little bit more light in front of it so it can capture what's in front of you. Um, I would prefer if you are shooting with a phone not to use flash for this assignment. So keep that in mind. If you do use flash, I need some kind of visual justification on why uh, it was needed. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's go to the next one. So here are some examples. Um, I'm gonna show both interior and night examples. Um, here's one by the photographer Edward Weston, um, modernist photographer um, during the 20th century. And this is uh, his pepper photograph. Um, and he used uh, a large format camera in order to get this image. And just, just look at how kind of beautiful the, the subject is. You're not really sure what it is at first. It's abstract in its form, but it's it, when we boil it down, it's a still life of a pepper. And it was just the, the way, but think about the lighting, think about the form, the, the, the curving of, uh, of the subject, uh, the, almost dramatic lighting, the, the highlights that are on the pepper, like all of that makes this an interesting image, right? Um, so think about that and utilize that, uh, those ideas when, if you're doing a still life in, inside, like what is something that can be just everyday object, like a green bell pepper? Um, and all of a sudden it's transformed into this whole different way of looking and seeing um, based on perception, angle of view, lighting, all that stuff, okay? Here's another really nice interior image by uh, the photographer Andre Cortez. Um, look at this really soft kind of north lighting that's being uh, cast. Um, we have a lot of, we have, so we have the stairwell that kind of goes up here. So think about uh, compositional values, right? We have kind of like this centering point right here. We have these leading lines, this kind of leading us. Um, and then you have kind of these doorways kind of, you know, framing uh, everything for us. The light here. Um, the shapes kind of mimic each other like the hat and then the the vase for the flower again uh we have another kind of these uh mimicking shapes that are happening over here leading lines again from the steps um yeah just all compositionally it's very nice but also just lighting is very soft and delicate and a beautiful image so yeah thinking about um, this is also thinking about kind of uh, distance from you and your subject matter. This is very close. If you watch the camera me mechanic video, um, I think I tell you that um, getting close to your images is a lot harder than getting further away. So you're, having that critical point of focus is going to be a lot harder if you get close. But if you back up to kind of to a medium realm, you can get it's a little easier and it's going to generally look nicer potentially. Um, here's an interesting image uh, by Lee Friedlander. Um, so we have, you know, these, these kind of strange kind of 60s-esque um, living room. Um, and he happened to capture um, this woman's head that's on the tube television. So um, kind of this kind of like kind of expected view, but then all of a sudden you have kind of like this unexpected thing that's happening with it, that's right. Um, so Clarence Laughlin, uh, yeah, just, Again, thinking about you know, shadow and leading lines and, um, you know, 
what can interiors offer? And it's like, it's really based on um, how you taking the time in a space and figuring out an interesting way to capture it. If you just kind of blindly shoot or, you know, however you're shooting, um, then it's going to be possibly pretty boring. Um, but if you really take the time to look and to see, okay, um, what is fascinating within this space, um, then you can kind of start creating these fascinating, um, you know, views. Um, here's an interior image with people in it uh, by Yosef Kadelka. Um, he probably had a lot higher film speed here. He probably had to blow out um, the um, highlights in the window, but was able to capture kind of this funeral scene um, that he was photographing. Um, here's a still life uh, by Andrew Cunningham of uh, a hand being very still next to um, probably, uh, not sure what that first object is. It could be some pottery next to a skeleton, all laying on a mirror. So thinking about kind of constructing kind of a still life too. Um, the pepper was constructed. This is kind of a construction too. Like how can you manipulate um, your, um, your bedroom or, you know, have like a table and just like, put stuff together in order to kind of um, create these kind of dynamic images. Um, there's a photographer I really like, uh, Barbara Caston. Um, you should look at some of her color imagery as well, but um, I think I picked, these are all black and white imageries, images uh, that I picked. Um, but she, uh, all she does is she gets pieces of glass and kind of puts them together and then gets lights and trying and points them in kind of bizarre ways in order to create these kind of bizarre kind of geometrical spaces. Um, and that's kind of her signature style. So, but thinking about how light is passing through these uh, translucent um, material and how they reflect off of each other and how you know, all that stuff. And it's, um, a very appealing, nice image to look at. So this looks strange. What's this? At first glance, you might think, oh, that's a image um, in the jungle. Or then you, then you look at it a little bit more and you're like, well, that doesn't look quite right. Uh, maybe this is like an image taken on a movie set. Well, what Sujimoto did was he went to the um, New York uh, New York City uh, Museum of Natural Sciences and or Natural History, I think is what it's called. And um, there are these dioramas that are in there, and he photographed them, um, and in a way where they are almost lifelike, but uncannily aren't. And they aren't, they're, they're a falsehood of what reality is. I mean, um, we're thinking about kind of like all of these elements and the fact that it's in black and white, you're looking at kind of the form and kind of like what exists within the frame. If it was in color, kind of be more maybe glaringly obvious. Or if there was another kind of like, if they, he showed, um, you know, the actual kind of uh, framing of the diorama or like a bench in front of the diorama that would have clued us into what it was. The fact that he got into it, the space with the camera, it's in black and white. It kind of fools you at first. So yeah, thinking about uh, this is more of just like a content thing in general, but like, how do we fool someone else's eye and how do we um, essentially make a more, interesting image. Here's Sujimoto again. Um, so he did a whole series um, uh, called uh, theaters. So you go into these kind of old movie theaters 
and he would uh, press the shutter right when the movie would begin and then release it um, as the movie would end. So all of that time that had been passed with the movie is rendered essentially a white blank void. Um, and that's how time is shown in a still image, which can be an interesting thought experiment, right? So um, yeah. So here are some mad examples. Uh, one of, I think one of the better night photographers is the Frenchman uh, Brazai. Um, he's one of the first um, to do a lot of kind of night portrait, night uh, imagery. Um, his whole book called, um, I think, uh, Paris at Night is kind of one of the first early um, kind of uh, series on kind of exploring of the space in, in at nighttime. Um, so. Yeah, just thinking about the fog, thinking about the light, thinking from the, 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 the lamps and also the, the car, um, all of it kind of working together can kind of create this almost uh, film noir effect. So here are some star trails. This is what uh, I talk, was talking about earlier. Um, you've probably seen tons of imagery like this before the way to do this is literally have your shutter open be in a very dark place and have your shutter open for hours um and when i mean dark i mean pitch black there's not a um barn light or any sort of lighting around you you're out in the country and that's how you get um these types of imageries. And if you're using a DSLR, this is a film camera, you can leave it open for that long and it's not gonna mess it up, but your digital sensor can't read that much information at a time. So generally you do 30 seconds to a minute intervals. And then in, in, in post, you stack them all up and then it creates that time lapse in one image, right? So <clears throat> here's Brazai again. Look at the water. It looks like glass um, or fog almost. Um, and it was just this very kind of impressionistic. And the lighting is very just kind of soft, but moody and theatrical. You have the silhouette here of the, the branch. And it just all, it all kind of works together, right? Here's an image of um, a fair. Uh, by Robert Adams. It almost looks like daylight. Um, that's the fascinating thing about some night imagery is that if you expose it long enough, it almost looks like day. Um, but this is a night image. Another Robert Adams image of just a home with the moon kind of out in the country. And you can see kind of this little lens flare here um, from the moon. And that's um, happening from probably how long he had his shutter open. So um, yeah, um, thinking, think about subject matter with the rear imagery. Why did I forget this one? Um, hold on. So um, here's an Ansel Adams uh, night image. Um, it's called um, View over Hernandez, um, very famous image, and you have kind of this graveyard and this little kind of a, uh, adobe um, church and kind of um, maybe a little farm, and then you have a mountain range, and over here you have the moon um, rising out of out of the western landscape, and it's just very kind of again, this is kind of colliding landscape imagery with night photography, right? Um, all of these. Um, here's an image of the being there. More urban area versus more country or rural, these other ones. Todd Haido. Yeah, um, just thinking about 
again, composition, subject matter, how is it going to, you know, influence and make their image better? Uh, you see kind of like almost this uh, star effect that happens when you have a very small aperture. Um, if you have a wider one, the light source is going to get wider too with your lens, if that makes sense. That might be it. So, um, yeah, I don't have any more. So, uh, yeah, that's those are some of my examples. I'm going to throw up another video uh, someone else made. Um, yeah, if you have any questions or concerns about any of this stuff, um, I would also just go back to this, um, you know, as kind of basics on how to, you know, push through this. So uh, yeah, please, if you have any questions or concerns, please get to me uh, on that, uh, happy photograph, thanks.